Welcome, my name is Gretchen Schmidt, and I'm with the Jinji Good Earth YouTube video channel, and today I would like to go over Chapter 2, The Universal History of the United States, and also to talk about uh, America. And here's our great flag of America. And again, I have made it my commitment for helping to strengthen, educate on the importance of our heritage and why civility reflects on the longevity of humanity and that we all should be helpful sojourners to our communities and I also have a Etsy.com store, Wild Trout Lily, and you'll find my books there. One is on beekeeping and the history of the honeybee with poetry and prose. The second is Pittsburgh, Victoria, and all that is gilded. And then the third book is White Buffalo Spirit. And I was one out of 30 people with Lakota Nation in Salzburg, Pennsylvania at the Thunder Mountain Lenape Nation powwow. Well, we witnessed a white buffalo cloud in the sky, and the name for white buffalo is Kantanka. And that was a miracle. But I'd like to further reflect that I'm here to educate, amuse, and enrich, and that nice matters, and we want to have this fun field and artistic. And history is a reflection of our past, and it has to tell the truth. We will learn from our past, so for our civility's sake, we should always read, seek, and find truth historical facts, not random rumors. And today also we'll address different topics and suggestions, but please uh, review the YouTube channel, You Are Free TV. They had a program on bio, digital, social programming. And I thought that discussion really has an expertise of excellence of information and I highly recommend that you read that. Now I have my video uh, on the front porch today. I'm trying um, new ways to read the book because again it's difficult to listen to an individual read line verbatim um, from a book and I thought it would be quite entertaining. I put out the bird seed, the nuts, and the fruits uh, for the uh, chickmunk, and I have named the chickmunk Chippy Chickmunk. He comes out every year. <laughs> and also for the red cardinals and the robin redbreast, I have four eggs in the nest in the backyard, and also for any other birds that are welcome to come this morning. Uh, today is May 20th. 2020. So it's a it's a irrelevant day. When do you have the the day of the month the same as the day of the year of 2020? But without further ado, I would like to go ahead and read. And I was going to play a CD, but it looks like the power is out. But anyhow, we'll we'll go with this. So let me begin. The Universal History of the United States, Part 1st, Chapter 2. From the settlement of Jamestown to the embarkation of the Plymouth Company, the discovery of America by Columbus gave a new impulse to that bold spirit of adventure which characterized the hardy age in which he lived. Although several men of rank and fortune were concerned in the companies which had been formed in England for colonizing America, 
their funds appear to have been very limited, and their first efforts were extremely feeble. The first expedition for the southern colony consisted of one vessel of a hundred tons and two barks, with a hundred and five men destined to remain in the country. The command of this small fleet was given to Captain Newport, who sailed from the Thames the 19th of December, 1606. At the time his instructions were given, three packages sealed with the seal of the council were delivered, one to Captain Newport, one to Captain Bartholomew, Gosnold, and the third captain, John Ratcliffe containing the names of the council for the colony. They were directed not to open these packages within 24 hours after their arrival on the coast of Virginia, and the names of His Majesty's council were then to be proclaimed. The council were then to proceed in the choice of a president, who should have two votes. To this singular and unaccountable concealment, have been in a great degree attributed with the dissensions which distracted the colonists on their passage, and which afterwards considerably impeded the progress of their infant settlement. Newport, whose place of destination was Roanoke, took the circumstances route back to West India Islands, and had a long passage of four months the reckoning had been out for three days without perceiving land, and serious propositions were made for returning to England, and when were overtaken by a storm, which fortunately drove them to the mouth of the Chesapeake. This book was written in 1830, and my copy of the book is 1888, and it's very browned, and it's leather-bound, so I, I have to read through the molding of the papers in order to read this book. So this is a challenge. As we begin, on the 26th of April, 1607, they discerned Cap Henry, and soon after Cape Charles, impatient to land, a party of about 30 men went on shore at Cape Henry but they were immediately attacked by the natives, who considered them as enemies, and in the skirmish which ensued, several were wounded on both sides. The first employment of the colonists was to explore the adjacent country, which the appearance of which they were greatly delighted, and to select a spot on which their settlement should be made. They proceeded up a large, beautiful river called by the natives Bahatan, and to which they gave the name of James on a peninsula, on the north side of which they immediately agreed to make the first establishment of their colony. This place, as well as the river, they named after their king and called it Jamestown. There they debarked on the 13th of May, and the sealed packets being opened, Mr. Wingfield was, by the council, elected their president. But under frivolous and unjustifiable pretext, they excluded Smith from taking his seat among them. John Smith, whose, whose courage and talents seemed to have excited their envy, and who in the passage had been imprisoned on the improbable and unsupportable charge of intending to murder the council, usurped the government, and make himself king of Virginia, which, by the way, the state of Virginia was named by Queen Elizabeth of England. The colonists soon found themselves embroiled with the Indians, and a 
who attacked them suddenly while at work, but were frightened by the fire from the ship, and in a short time a temporary accommodation with them was effected. Although Newport was named of the council, he was ordered to return with a vessel to England, and the time of the, his departure approached the accusers of Smith affecting a degree of humanity which they did not feel proposed that he should return with Newport. Instead of being prosecuted in Virginia, but with the pride of conscious innocence, he demanded his trial. And being purportedly acquitted, took his seat in the council. About the 15th of June, Newport sailed for England, leaving behind him one bark and about a hundred persons, the only English then on the continent of America. Well, who could tell me what one bark means and then email me at gibsongirls at mail.com. Well, we're going to have an exciting visitor. Here comes Chippy Chipmunk. He's approaching the um, American duck, the mallard duck. Here he comes. You can watch on the video. It's exciting. Thus, about 110 years after this continent had been discovered by Cabot and 22 years after a colony had been conducted to Roanoke by Sir Richard Greenville, the English possessions in America designed soon to become a mighty empire were limited to a peninsula to be, of a few thousand acres of land held by a small body of men who with difficulty maintained themselves against the paltry tribes which surrounded them and looked in a great measure to the other side of the Atlantic for the bread on which they were to subsist. The stock of the provisions for the colony had been very improvidential laid in. It was entirely inadequate to their wants and in addition to this original error, it had sustained great damage in the holds of the vessels during their long passage. So in the holds of the vessels, that's the bottom of the ship, the storage area, and that's where box were labeled S period, H period, I period, T period. Who can tell me what those letterings mean and email me at gibsongirls at mail.com. On the departure of Newport, during whose stay they managed to partake of the superfluity of the sailors, they were reduced to the necessity of subsisting on the distributions from the public stores. These were, at the same time, scanty and unwholesome. They did not amount to more per man than a pint of warm, eaten wheat and barley boiled in a common kettle. This wretched food increased the m malignity of the diseases generated by a hot and, at that time, the country being entirely uncleaned and undrained, a damp climate among men exposed from their situation to all the, its rigors. Before the month of September, 50 of the company, and among them Bartholomew Gosnold, and who originated the expedition and so much contributed toward its being carried on, were buried. This scene of distress was heightened by eternal dissension. The president was charged with having embezzled the best stores of the colony and of feasting at his private table with beef and bread, then deemed luxuries of the highest order, while famine and death devoured his fellow adventurers. No crime, in the public opinion, 
could have been more atrocious. In addition to this, he was detected in attempt to escape from them, their calamities in the bark which had been left by Newport. The general indignation could no longer be restrained. He was dis deposed and R Radcliffe chosen to su succeed him. Misfortune is not unfrequently the parent of modern nation. And reflection and this state of misery produced a system of con conduct towards the neighboring Indians which for the moment disarmed their resentment and induced them to bring in such supplies as the country at that season afforded and thereby preserved the remnant of the colony it produced another effect not less important their sense of imminent and common danger called forth and compelled submission to those talents which were fitted to the exigence and best calculated to extricate them from the difficulties by which they were surrounded. Captain Smith, who had been imprisoned and expelled from the council by the envy of those who felt and hated his superiority, and who, after evincing his innocence, had with difficulty been admitted to the station assigned, preserved his health unimpaired, his spirits unbroken, and his judgment unclouded, amidst this general misery and dejection. In him, by common consent, all actual authority was placed, and he, by his own example, soon gave energy and efficiency to others in the execution of his commands. He immediately erected at Jamestown such rude fortifications as were necessary to resist the sudden attack of the savages and with great labor in which he always took the lead completed the construction of such dwellings as could shelter the people from the weather contributed to restore and preserve their health while his accommodation gave place to others in the season of gathering corn which with the indians is the season of plenty putting himself at the head of small parties he penetrated into the country and by presents and caresses to those that were well disposed and attacking with open force and defeating those who were hostile he obtained for his countrymen the most abundant supplies while this activity usefully employed abroad he was not permitted to withdraw his attention from the domestic concerns of the colony and here's the settlement of Jamestown it's a print and the landing of the pilgrims on Plymouth is the other print. However unfit men be for command, there are a few examples of their descending willingly from exalted stations once filled by them. And it is not wonderful that the late president saw the displeasure another place above him as unworthy minds most readily devise unworthy means he sought by intriguing with the factious and fermenting their discontents to regain his lost authority and when their attempts were disconcerted plans were laid first by Wingfield and Kendall, and afterwards by the president himself. In conjunction with Martin, 
the only remaining member of the council except Smith, to escape in the bark and thus abandon the country. The vigilance of Smith detected all these machine nations, and his vigor defeated them. The hope was now indulged of preserving the colony in quiet and plenty until supplies could be received from England with the ships which were expected in the spring. This hope was in considerable degree defeated by an event which threatened at first the most disastrous consequences. In an attempt to explore the head of Chickaharmony River, Smith was discovered and attacked by a numerous body of Indians and in endeavoring to make his escape after a most gallant defense, his attention being directed to the enemy, whom he still fought in retreating. He sunk up to his neck in a swamp and was obliged to surrender. Still retaining his presence of mind, he showed them a mariner's compass, at which, especially at the playing of the needle and the impossibility of touching it, although he saw it so distinctly, they were greatly astonished. And he amused them with so many surprising stories of its qualities as to inspire them with a degree of veneration, which prevented their executing their first design of killing him on the spot. They conducted him in triumph through several towns to the palace of Pohatan, and most potent king in the country. There he was doomed to be put to death by laying his head upon a log and beating his brains out with clubs. He was led to the place of execution and his head bowed down for the purpose of death. When Pocahontas, the king's daughter, then about 13 years of age, whose entreaties for his life had been ineffectual, Pocahontas rushed him, rushed between him and the executioner and folded his head in her arms and laying hers upon it, arrested the fatal blow. So that's the true story of Pocahontas. Her father was then prevailed on to spare his life and after a great many savage ceremonies, he was sent back to Jamestown. On his arrival thither, having been absent since, since seven weeks, he found the colonnary reduced to 38 persons, most of whom seemed determined to abandon the country, which appeared to them so unfavorable to human life. He was just in time to prevent the execution of this design, alternatively employing persuasions, threats, and even violence. He at length, with much hazard to himself, induced the majority to relinquish the intentions they had formed, and then turning the guns of the fort on the bark. On board, of which were the most determined, compelled them to remain or sink in the river. By the judicious regulation of their intercourse with the Indians, among whom Smith was now in high repute, he preserved plenty in the colony until the arrival of two vessels, which had been dispatched from England under the ca command of Captain Newport, with a supply of provisions, instruments of husbandry, and with a reinforcement of 120 persons, consisting of many gentlemen, a few laborers, and several refiners, goldsmiths, and jewelers. Oh, the joy of the colony on receiving this 
accession of force and supply of provisions was extreme. But the influence of Smith disappeared with the danger which had produced it, and an improvident relaxation of discipline, productive of the most pernicious consequences succeeding to it. Among the unwise practices which they tolerated an indiscriminate traffic, which the natives was permitted, in the course of which some obtained further commodities, much better bargains than others, which inspired those who had been most heartily dealt by, and who thought themselves cheated with the resentment against the English generally, and a consequent thirst for revenge. About this time was found, washed down by a small stream of water, back of Jamestown, a glittering earth which by the colonists was mistaken for gold dust. All that raging thirst for gold was accompanied the first Europeans who visited the American continent seemed re-excited by this incident. Mr. Stith in his history says, there was nothing thought of but to dig gold, wash gold, refine gold, and load gold. <clears throat> and notwithstanding Captain Smith's warm and judicious representations, how, how absurd it was to neglect all the other things of immediate use and necessity to load such a drunken ship with gilded dust, yet was he overruled, and her returns were made with a parcel of glittering dirt, which is to be found in various parts of the country, and which they very genuinely concluded to be gold dust. So again, Mr. Stith in his history says, there was nothing thought of but to dig gold, wash gold, refine gold, and load gold. One vessel returned in the spring of 1608, the other the 2nd of June, laden with dust, the other with with cedar. This is the first remittance ever made from America by an English colony. The effects of this fatal delusion were such as might have been foreseen, and were soon felt. The colony began to suffer, and the same distress from the scarcity of food which had before brought it to the brink of ruin. The researches of English settlers had not yet extended beyond the countries adjacent to James River. Smith had formed the bold design of exploring the Great Bay of the Chesapeake, examining the mighty rivers which empty into it, opening an entrance with the nations inhabiting them, and acquiring a knowledge of the state of their cultivation and population. Again, there were no Indian tribes in North America, only Indian nations. And from my memory, there are th over 362 First American, Native American nations. This hardly enterprise he undertook, accompanied by Dr. Russell, in an open boat of about three tons burthen with the crew of 13 men. On the 2nd of June, he fell down the river in company with the last of Newport's two vessels and parted with her at the Capes. Beginning his survey at Cap Charles, he examined with immense fatigue and danger every river, inlet, and bay on both sides of the Chesapeake as far as the mouth of the Rephpavanonic, from whence their provisions being exhausted, he returned to Jamestown. He reached the place on the 21st of July and found the colony in almost confusion and disorder. Those who had arrived last with Newport were all sick, and general scarcity prevailed. 
and universal discontent with the president, whom they charged with rottenously consuming the stores and unnecessarily fatiguing the people with building a house of pleasure for himself in the woods. The seasonable arrival of Smith prevented their fury from breaking out in acts of personal violence. Their views were extended and their spirits revived by the accounts he gave of his discovery. They contented themselves with deposing their president, and Smith was urged, but refused to succeed him, having made in three days arrangements for obtaining regular supplies and for the government of the colony, his firm friend, Mr. Scrivener, was appointed vice president, and on the 14th of July, he again set out with 12 men to complete his discoveries. From his voyage, he returned on the 7th of September. He had adventured as far as the river Susquehanna, and the Susquehannocks lived there, the nation of first Americans, and visited all the countries on both sides of the river. He entered most of the large creeks and sailed up many of the great rivers to their falls. When he considered that he sailed above 300 miles in an open boat, when we contemplate the dangers and hardships he encountered and the fortitude, courage, and patience with which he met them, when we reflect on the useful and important additions which he made to the stock of knowledge respecting America, then possessed by his countrymen, we shall not hesitate to say that few voyages of discovery undertaken at any time reflect more honor on those engaged in them than this does on Captain Smith. It may not be entirely unworthy of a remark that about the bottom of the bay, Smith went with a party of Indians from the St. Lawrence River coming to war with those at the neighborhood, and that he found among the Indians on the Susquehanna hatchets obtained originally from the French in Canada. On the 10th of September, immediately after his return from his expedition, he was chosen president by the council and accepted the office. Soon after Newport arrived with an additional supply of inhabitants, among them were the two first females who had ventured into the country, but he came without provisions. The distinguished, judicious, and vigorous administration of the president, however, supplied their wants and restrained the turbulent. Encouraged by his example, coerced by his authority, a spirit of industry and subordination appeared to be created in the colony, which was the parent of plenty and peace. In the meantime, the company in England became excessively dissatisfied with their property of America. They had calculated on discovering a passage to the South Sea and mines of the precious metals, which might afford to individuals the same sudden accumulation of wealth which had been acquired by the Spaniards in the South. In all their hopes, they had been grievously disappointed and has as yet received scarcely any advantage for the heavy expenses they had incurred. Yet hope did not altogether forsake them, and they still indulged in golden dreams of future wealth. Again, there was nothing thought of but to dig gold, wash gold, refine gold, and load gold. And all they had found was a parcel of glittering dirt. I'm going to stop there on page 21 and uh, follow up because I have a very inexpensive camera 
video camera and I just want to end with a comment and some poetry and again I'm reading the Vikings uh, again again I would like to mention if we sit very quietly yeah, I wanted to mention something. I was on the board of directors for 16 years at the Allegheny Kiskaminis Valley Museum, AK Valley Museum. And I, um, programming and education for 16 years on the board of directors. And so that I have a exceptional history of the state of Pennsylvania and New York. And I have an article on the Braddock's defeat. But I wanted to mention the Meadowcroft Village, which is run by the Senator Hines History Center. And again, that village at Meadowcroft, which I have been there many times, it's a worthwhile visit, is a early as 1000 before Christ, it's, it's a shelter built by the hunters and gatherers as early as 1000 BC. And it has prehistoric campsite that exhibits primitive huts, tools, and demonstrations. And it's very worth looking up on the internet. And I was very impressed when I went to see this shelter. It's basically against the mountainside and it's a rock shelter that was inhabited in 1000 BC. So I wanted to mention that. And I wanted to mention the book that I wrote, Honey for All. It not only does it talk about the honeybee story, it includes poetry, recipes, and honey beekeepers history. And if you go to Etsy, Dot com wild trout lily I make the books by hand there are no page numbers every page has a picture practically and I have a lot of historical uh, pictures and um, I will read a poem on environment and let's see if I can find let's just get it I'm gonna, I definitely need a drinking, I have my hot tea. I teach teaism too. In 1996, when the Republic of China opened the market for tea, um, I brought in 100 teas and tisans from all over the world and did tea taste testing and I opened up um, educating and helping to open up different tea rooms in the Pittsburgh arena. So I'd like to read Beautiful. The waters are beautiful, so why do you pollute them? Do you want to die from thirst? Do you no longer want to swim with the dolphins or lay on the beach with the water? The sky is beautiful, so why do you pollute it? Do you want to die from the poison you breathe? Do you no longer want to soar with the eagle or run through the fields with the wind? The ground is beautiful, so why do you pollute it? Do you want to die from starvation? Do you no longer want to watch the butterfly, the honeybee, or walk through the woods with the sun? The earth is beautiful, so why do you pollute it? 